Heavenly Father, I believe that you have a lot of stuff that you want us to hear to talk about tonight. And I believe that you are the God who sees everything that we're going through. You're the God who hears our deepest hurts and our faintest needs. You're the God who... <laughs> You're the exceedingly, you do the exceeding abundant above all we can ask or imagine. So God, I ask that you would take uh, this portion in Genesis and that you would speak through me um, this evening and that you would uh, teach us all. I pray that you'd give us all ears to hear what this Holy Spirit has to say and uh, hearts to receive um, for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. So we're going to be, um, we're going to go back a little bit to Genesis 1.18, but we're going to first, I'm going to read John 16. You're welcome to turn there if you want to, uh, 7 to 11. Uh, we're not going to spend a ton, 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 wow, we're not going to spend a ton of time there. That's a tongue twister. John 16. Maybe if I just speak slowly, then we'll be fine. John 16, verse 7 is where we're going to begin. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples shortly before the crucifixion. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And then verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God, right, um, is referred to as the helper. And we've seen in creation so far... God the Father is the primary God we're introduced to in chapter 1. Uh, we spent a bit of time looking at John chapter 1 introducing Jesus. So I just wanted to take a minute and read a little bit about the Holy Spirit. And uh, that will become plain as to the reasoning in a few minutes. Um, for now, John 1.18. Nope. John 2.18. I wonder if I did that through all my notes. Yes, John 2. <laughs> Some of you were thinking, oh no, we're stuck back there again. <laughs> then the Lord God said, and as a reminder, the Lord God, when he says that is Jehovah Elohim, um, the first personal name of God that we have. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper fit for him. So God arranged for Adam to become familiar with many of the animals by personal inspection. There is apparently a twofold, at least, purpose for this. Uh, one, acquainting him with his responsibilities um, regarding the animal kingdom. Um, and two, emphasizing to him that although he could exercise rulership over them, he could not have fellowship with them. Verse 19 continues Adam's reaction of creation. If you recall, I, I believe he's the one telling the story that is being passed down. Um, 
the recitation with excitement. He says, out of the ground, Jehovah had formed every beast of the field. Out of the ground, Jehovah had formed every bird of the heavens. He introduced a lot of them to me that afternoon. This is obviously not direct scripture. I am now telling a story. Let me be clear. These words are not there. We started off with God showing me the canines and felines, dogs, cats, you know, basic red-tailed foxes, a lion, a lioness, a few birds, then a couple horses trotted on upright. Picture it. He's sitting there with God, and I don't know how this went. This part isn't recorded, but it's not just, okay, and he named all the things just randomly. It popped out of his head. No, these creatures walked by him, right? And so he goes on to name them. Ah, it was a veritable zoo there at the entrance of the garden. He got to play with ferrets and maybe skunks before the curse. Observed some hyena running along past the leopards. Uh, I can imagine him thinking, you know, I'm going to let this bull and this cow into the garden. We don't know if there's any animals actually in the garden. Uh, You know, this could have been at the gate. This could have been outside. Maybe a a ram, some sheep, you know, because their wool's so fluffy. And, I mean, they've got to be decent animals, especially at the beginning, right? The hippopotamuses were amazing, but they didn't stay out of the river for long. Um, On and on it went. I bet he noted upwards of 3,000 different creatures just doing some basic math over the course of a five to seven hour period. He could have easily seen 3,000 different couples walk past him. And we don't know. We don't know if, you know, 20 sheep went by. We don't know if it was two horses. We don't know how many there were. Just enough for him to get the concept, right? What a day he would have had with Jehovah. And there were similarities between those animal pairs and Adam. But I can picture him saying that I recall I was made in the image of God. And there were some differences. I mean, besides opposable thumbs, right? It seems that mankind was smart from the, built, from the beginning. If this is the first task that we have recorded for him to do, why did he name the elephant the elephant? Which, of course, he didn't. He used his own language, which was not English at the time, but because it looked like an elephant, right? Verse 20, but for the man there was not found a helper fit for him. Now, um, let me just throw in as a note that if he had had siblings, if he had had parents, if he was descended from the ape, if he, whatever the step before him was, he would have been able to have fellowship with them. He would not have been alone. There would have been couples. There would have been kids. There would have been some sort of progenitor, you know, how do you make that a verb? happening. Um, but God clearly notes that this was not the case. Genesis 1, and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. This is Genesis 1. I did go back this time. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Man needed a co-laborer. Man needed a complementary other because he sure couldn't be fruitful and multiply on his own. Um, Nope, I'm going to resist the urge. Genesis 2.20 to 25. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, you know what? I want to interrupt before that. 
Several um, scholars now say that it probably wasn't a literal rib. It actually would have been a better interpretation to say that God took part of his side, part of the muscle, part of the bone, the blood, the whole thing, not just a rib. Anyways, keeping that in mind, it makes much more sense when the man says in verse 23, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. In the beginning, there was no sin. In the beginning, there was no shame. In the beginning... Humanity, Adam and Eve, were totally open, totally exposed to each other without conviction of sin, without guilt, without shame, because there was no reason for it. This is what it means to be made naked and unashamed, and this was God's plan for humanity to be open and exposed and honest and bare and complementary to each other um, before God and before man being open. Man was created a dependent being. Unlike any other creature on earth, he has a combined body and spirit. Apart from God supplying his daily needs at this point, mankind cannot continue. In addition, God did not create human beings to be isolated persons. He made us in such a way that we can attain interpersonal unity of various sorts in all forms of human society. Interpersonal unity can be especially deep in human family, but interpersonal unity can also be deep in spiritual family, i.e. the church. A husband and wife joined together in marriage are people that God has joined together. Um, I would refer you to Matthew 19, 6 for Jesus' uh, comments about that. Sexual union with someone other than one's own spouse is especially offensive to God as it is a sin against one's own body and one's spouse and our maker in whose image we're made. Casual sex is not a thing scripturally it's an american thing it's a young people thing it's a well probably worldwide yeah probably it's a yeah actually it definitely is it's an old people thing it's not just a young people thing it's a human outside of christ not caring about the divine plan not caring about the bond with someone hmm not sacred yeah not sacred the union between husband and wife is not temporary, but lifelong under God's plan. Malachi, <laughs> okay, so you start in Genesis and you go to the end of the book. Malachi is the last book in the Bible. Uh, it's the one right in the Old Testament, I should say, the one right before Matthew, if you know where Matthew is. Uh, Malachi 2, 13 to 17 Actually, let's look there real quick. Malachi or Malachi, the, on, the only Italian prophet. Uh, if you need to use the concordance, the table of uh, contents in the front of your Bible, go for it. Malachi 2, uh, 13 through 17. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. Verse 13. You have said... Oh, that's verse chapter 3. Chapter 2. Okay. And this second thing you do... Oh, nope, sorry. Here's another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. 
because the Lord witnessed the vows that you and your wife made when you were young, but you have been unfaithful to her, though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife in body and spirit? You are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart, remain loyal to the wife of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Divorce your, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven, uh, the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight, and he is pleased with them. You have wearied him by asking, where is the God of justice? Keep that last verse in mind as we uh, go through this. Um, I also could point you to Romans 7, um, verses 1 to 3, um, as another reference uh, for marriage meant to be lifelong. It is not trivial, but is it, a pro- it is a profound relationship created by God to picture the relationship between Christ and his church, which, of course, is Ephesians 5 in the 20s somewhere. The fact, hmm, the fact that God created two distinct persons as male and female rather than just one man is part of our being in the image of God because it can be seen to reflect some degree to some degree, the plurality of the persons within the Trinity. In the verse prior to the one that tells of the creation of male and female, we see the first explicit indication of a plurality of persons within the Godhead uh, when he says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Up until that point, it was just the plurality of the word Elohim. The fact that God is three in one, while Adam and Eve were only two in one, may be a reminder that, I don't know, God's excellence is greater than ours. Uh, He possesses far greater ability, far greater plurality, far greater unity than we can possess. I understand that unity is not the same, um, but the unity in a family, among husband and wife and children, also reflects to some degree the interpersonality, yet diversity of persons uh, as the members of the Trinity does. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, husband, wife, children, who then become husbands or wives or children, and on and on. Um, Let's not forget the scripture um, that is often used in wedding ceremonies, Ecclesiastes 4. 9 to 12, you don't have to turn there. As I've typed it out, I'll be reading it quickly here. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if one falls, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Yes. Obviously encouraging um, the relationship of God in the marri- marriage relationship. You'll find out I talk with my hands a lot. The union between husband and wife is not trivial, but it's a profound relationship created by God in order to picture the relationship between Christ and his church. Ephesians 5.33 However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, so sitting in front of you is a prime example of a single person. God has not ordained or I have not paid attention clearly enough to find uh, someone suitable for me. I'm sure that there have been plenty of suitable women that have passed before me. I have dated several Um, women that I did not feel for various reasons um, were who the Lord was calling me to marry. I will give, I will give no examples of that right now because there's so much more important stuff. (laughs) But if you'd like to know about some of the women that I have uh, dated, then I'm happy to tell you. (laughs) Not on recording and God loves them very much. (laughs) 
All right, Jesus wasn't married. Maybe that's a better example. Or Paul wasn't married, at least during his, some of his evangelistic efforts. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 7 anyways, if marriage is such an important, um, which I'm not going to read here, if marriage was such an important part of our reflection of the image of God, then why were they not married, Paul and Jesus? Why did Paul encourage others not to be married? For Jesus, the situation is unique. He's both God and man. He's the sovereign Lord over all creation. Rather than being married to any one individual person, person, the Bible is filled with the picture that he will one day meet his bride, the church, when we are raptured, and the bride, all of us who love him uh, and have accepted have repented of our sins and have accepted the free gift of salvation, we'll spend eternity with our groom, which is perhaps awkward for me to say, but the Bible says it, so I'm perfectly cool with it that way, with Jesus Christ. Imagine the spiritual and emotional unity that will last for eternity among ourselves, each other, and with God. The situation with Paul and his advice to the Corinthian Christians is somewhat different. Paul never says it's wrong to marry. 1 Corinthians 7, 28 and 36. Rather, he views marriage as something good, a right and a privilege that might be given up in some circumstances for the kingdom of God. I think that in view of the present distress, he says, it is good for a person to remain as he is. The appointed time has grown very short, for the present form of this world is passing away. In this way, Paul's give up. In this way, Paul gives up one way he might reflect likeness to God, marriage, in order to further other ways which he might reflect likeness to God and further God's purposes in the world, namely in his work for the church. His evangelism and his discipleship are frequently referred to as him having spiritual children and nurturing them in the Lord. The entire building up of the church was a process of bringing thousands of people to glorify God as they reflected his character more fully in their lives. And marriage is not the only way in which unity and diversity in the Trinity can be reflected in our lives. It can be reflected in the union of believers, in the fellowship of the church, in genuine church fellowship. Single persons as well as those who are married can have interpersonal relationships that reflect the true nature of God, of the Trinity. Uh, It's a blessing to see both godly women and godly men in their contemporary differences together, reflecting the beauty of God's character. I'm not asking for an answer. These are rhetorical questions, okay? I'll just say that up front. You're welcome to answer if you want to, but I'm not asking for one. Who can pray more effectively, men or women? Who can sing praises to God better, men or women? Who will have more spiritual sensitivity and depth of relationship with God? Men and women are equal in their ability to receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Both men and women have been mighty prayer warriors, prevailing over earthly powers and kingdoms and spiritual strongholds in the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps an answer, perhaps the answer to the question should be both together. Although there's a lot of value in men's prayer meetings, and there's a lot of value in women's prayer meetings, and perhaps discussions and prayers will be slightly different in each, there's nothing richer and more complete than the whole fellowship of God's people, men, women, even children who are old enough to understand and participate, gather together before God's throne in prayer as we've started doing on the occasional Sunday morning upstairs. Acts 2.1 says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. 
Acts 4.24 says, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Acts 12.12, Peter went into the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Galatian chapter, Galatians chapter 3 ends by saying, There are neither Jews nor Greeks nor slave nor free, male nor female, We are one in Christ Jesus and heirs according to the promise. I think Keith actually talked about that a little bit on Sunday morning. Allow me to be clear. Um, A guy named David Isaacs points out the different groups that give worth to women differently. Several cults say that women get their worth um, as birthing machines. Feminism would say career, money, um, obviously not all feminists. Sexual attractiveness apparently is uh, something that modern media and entertainment would have women believe is where you get your worth. Social media Uh, the same nowadays as we see more and more young ladies especially but I would say an increasing number of young men also challenged and maybe shamed whether appropriately or not by people's a reels on social media as they live the b reel of their boring or uneventful life or as people touch up their photos on social media when you know what they look like in real life. Um, the Bible says, so cults, etc., say all these things, but the Bible says a woman's value is intrinsic because she is made in the image of God. Amen. That is where all of our value comes from, being made in the image of God. In the image of God created he, him, male and female, he created them. So we've talked about marriage. We've talked a little bit about singleness. Um, We've talked a little bit about uh, adultery and casual sex. Um, Why not just hit everything and take a few minutes to talk about same-sex attraction as well? Um, as marriage has become a huge topic, um, well, I'll just say in my lifetime uh, in the country here and around the world as far as that goes. Uh, A lot of what I'm going to say comes from years of interacting with men and women who struggle with same-sex attraction. Um, May I have several friends who were active in the gay lifestyle Um, who left the gay lifestyle, who committed their lives to Christ, became happily married, um, and were never tempted again uh, with same-sex attraction by a miraculous act of God. I have other friends who still have the temptation but choose to live the way that the Bible calls them to. Uh, And, of course, I have other friends that are just active in the gay lifestyle and could care less what Christ has to say. Um, I spent a lot of time um, involved in a local ministry that I won't name because we're being recorded, um, but had a lunch and learn here. Uh, I was on staff there for four or five years, so I've had a lot of uh, interactions with believers Uh, And not a few unbelievers um, trying to figure out what God's plan was for their lives. Um, I was debating saying, but the reason that I was involved in that ministry is because I have had same-sex attraction issues my entire life. I shouldn't say my entire life. From my teen years on, which is another thing I would be happy to talk to you about another time, and we'll get more into as we go through um, Genesis, because the topic, believe it or not, comes up quite a bit. (laughs) Um, So welcome to my world. So I feel like I speak with a bit of authority when I address this topic. Um, And I also will be taking a lot from various um, Christians uh, involved in the field, primarily in this instance, 
I'll be quoting even a lot from Dr. Michael Evans, who I will not say every time Dr. Michael Evans says. Uh, so just know that uh, a lot of this is from various um, interviews that he's done um, and books that various people have read. Uh, before we get to the exciting topic of same-sex attraction, though, um, can we all agree that murder is wrong? Yeah. Is murder always wrong? Yeah. Okay. I'm not talking about is killing ever appropriate. I'm saying is murder always wrong, just to be clear. We believe, I think, and could all agree that adultery is always wrong. Being married to someone, committing your life to someone, and then having a side, a side fling is wrong. I think that we can all agree that alcoholism and drunkenness is always wrong. Um, why? Why do we believe that murder and adultery and intoxication is wrong? Well, yes, because the Bible tells us so, but also because they are an affront to the image of God. When someone murders, they take the life of an image bearer of God. When someone commits adultery, they're breaking faith with an image bearer of God and also affecting a third image bearer of God. Sometimes a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. When someone is constantly drunk, it's an affront to one's own self as an image bearer of God, not to mention how we potentially can affect others who bear the image of God. Matthew 5, 17 to 18 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. For those that don't speak Hebrew, the uh, iota and the tittle, which uh, is translated dot, are the smallest little portions. Some, some of the letters have like a little squiggly. Some have a little kind of dot over them. And it's like saying not a dotted I or a cross T um, will pass away until all is accomplished. He then goes on to discuss murder and lust and adultery all there in Matthew 5 and 6. Feel free and study that for yourself sometime and so much more. When he says he came to fulfill the law, he was referring, referring to the law, the ceremonial law, the law of Moses, but he's also referring to the moral law. He fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He fulfilled hundreds of prophecies about himself uh, Matthew one twenty two, Matthew thirteen thirty five, John nineteen thirty six, Luke twenty four forty four. I'm not going to read all the references. He fulfilled the law in at least two ways. He fulfilled them as a teacher, and he fulfilled them as a doer. He taught people to obey the law. Matthew twenty two forty five to forty, Mark one forty four. If you're not getting all these, they'll be on the recording, or you can come ask me after. I'll gladly let you look at my paper or tell you. He taught people to obey the law, and he obeyed the law himself. John 8, 46, 1 Peter 2, 22. In living a perfect life, Jesus fulfilled the moral laws. In his sacrificial death, Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial laws. <laughs> what? Christ Jesus, the second person of the triune God, fulfilled the law. Everything that had to do with him. I have no idea what that sentence means. Everything had to do with him as man approaching God. Everything that had to do with him was God approaching man. He became the perfect sacrifice and the great high priest. He fulfilled the old covenant. He fulfilled the Old Testament and he gave us a new one, the New Testament. Regarding the moral laws, he takes us to a higher level. 
This is something I hadn't thought about until studying for this. You've heard of old, don't commit adultery. I say, if you lust for another image bearer of God, you commit adultery. You've heard it said of old, don't commit murder. I say, if you hold hatred in your heart towards another image bearer of God, you commit murder in your heart. Getting back to Genesis, what is God's design for marriage? Genesis 1 says he created man and woman in his image. She's a suitable helper to him, a biological helper, an emotional helper, a spiritual helper. We read at the beginning that the Holy Spirit is the helper, is the comforter. She's helping fulfill that role in his life. Yes, he also has to fulfill part of that in her life. The two were created literally as one flesh. Adam was created. God took part of Adam, created Eve, and then when they're married and, of course, have, inter- have sex, they become one flesh again. Man corrupted this over time. Shocker. And quickly we'll see uh, throughout Genesis that man has multiple wives, concubines, slaves, all sorts of stuff, all of which contradict God's plan. But man with man and woman with woman is especially offensive and it was forbidden from the beginning. Matthew 19, 4 to 6 says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now I know some of you are getting restless. I know that uh, this is rubbing some of you the wrong way. So hear me. Better yet, hear God. Um, If murder and adultery and drunkenness are always wrong, then why isn't homosexuality always wrong? Amen. It is. Again, let me be perfectly clear. I know that I'm speaking with boldness. I know that I'm speaking from a place of conviction. But know that what I'm saying is saturated in the love of Jesus Christ. Know that... It's a conviction in my own heart, but I think it's a conviction in the heart of Christ himself based on all the scriptures that I've shared so far. And God is not willing that any should perish and God is not willing that anyone should be outside of his perfect plan and will for their lives. God wants us to choose life that we will live. God wants us not to choose cursing, not to choose death, not to choose sin, He loves us. People say that the God of the Old Testament is a God of hate. That's because they don't understand that everything, every law that he's given is for our benefit. Again, let me be perfectly clear. There's a big difference between temptation and sin. Someone mentioned tonight that they struggled with alcoholism. It's not a temptation for him to be tempted to take a drink sometime. For him, it might be a sin to drink. For someone else here, it might be a temptation every time they see an attractive person walk by to linger too long and think uh, impure thoughts and perhaps even act on those thoughts. The initial temptation of the attractive person walking by is not a sin. What you do with it after can become a sin. The temptation to murder someone can be very real sometimes. In our anger, in our heart of hearts, we could just wish someone dead. Don't act on it. As a matter of fact, give it to Christ, give it to God, give it to the Holy Spirit as soon as you possibly can so that it doesn't even become hatred in your heart. Jesus in Matthew 19, 4 to 6, refers back to Genesis and goes on to teach on divorce. And children, the holy plan was and remains one man, one woman, one lifetime. 
God forgives sins. God loves us. All of us are sinners. All of us have done so many things that make us unworthy of Christ, but for his choosing us. Consider the other commandments. Honor your mother and your father. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. These all pursue, presume one and one and one. One man, one woman, one lifetime. Honor your father and your mother. Husbands, your wives. Wives, your husbands. This becomes meaningful in a homosexual relationship. If there are two women, which one is the husband? If there are two men, which one is supposed to fulfill the role of the wife? And you might think, well, they can just decide them for themselves. But I will tell you that biologically and emotionally, men were created. Yes, there are some men that are more effeminate than others. Yes, there are some women that are more masculine than others. But they all are built to reflect the image of God. We haven't yet studied um, Genesis 3 uh, and the fall and the curses that fell upon humanity. So perhaps I should wait, should have waited for this till then. But we're talking about marriage and this is uh, important. Again, hear me. God does not condemn anyone to hell because they have an attraction. God requires certain conduct and obedience from me as a man with same-sex attraction. God requires certain conduct and obedience from all of us for the various temptations and sins that we have in our lives. God gave us eyes to see, yet some people are blind. God gave us ears to hear, yet some people are physically deaf. God biologically made us men for women and women for men, even though some are attracted to their same sex. God's order doesn't change. God's design doesn't change. Oh, but Charlie, my friend was born that way. Okay, I'm sorry. I love you. But even if that's true, that proves nothing. Scientists believe they've discovered a violent gene or a ruthless gene or an angry gene, but we don't approve of domestic violence. Scientists think that they've discovered an adulterous gene, something that makes you prone to act out, but we don't approve of adultery. Scientists believe alcoholism can be in your genes, but we have rehabs. Scientists have discovered that obesity is in the genes, but we don't have fat pride parades. Uh, Luke, (laughs) okay. I'll let you think about that one for a second. Luke 9.23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In the, King James Ver- in the New King James Version, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In the New Living Translation, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily and follow me. This is also in Matthew 16, 24, but I thought we spent enough time with Matthew, hence the Luke. Um, so what about a married man with an intense attraction to women that are not his wife? Yeah, subdue your desires and submit to Christ. Single and unable to find a mate, deny yourself. Submit to Christ. Prideful. Arrogant. Pick up that cross and follow. Born gay. You must be born again. John 3, 7 and 8. Well, what about if love is love? If love wins, then shouldn't that apply across the board? What if an adult father of a 25-year-old daughter? What if an adult father and a 25-year-old daughter are in love? Can they marry? No. Two adult brothers? 20-year-old twins? Can they marry? No. Thruples, 
polygamous groups, two men, two women, and a bisexual that all love each other? Does God allow all five of them to marry each other? Incest, I hope we all agree, is always wrong. But based on which scripture? The same section of scripture that condemns that is the same scripture that condemns homosexuality. Leviticus, Romans, etc. Love is not what ordains what is right and wrong. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in logic, are we free to do anything to anybody because we love them. Not to beat a dead horse, but if a husband falls in love with a lady at work and has relations, it's called adultery. But following the love lo logic, it's not wrong. If love is love, and he loves the work lady and no longer loves his wife, then he can leave his wife. But we would call that being unfaithful and disloyal. Okay, so... <laughs> I can hear you thinking, don't judge superficially. Don't condemn. Okay, so what if you're up for a stroll and you hear a, a young girl screaming and you look over and you see her father beating her? Do you intervene in some way? Do you call the police? No, because that would be judgmental. That, that would be uh, condemning someone for doing something. That's, that's not your call, right? No, absolutely, you would intervene. If you thought you could, you would separate them. At minimum, you would call the police and, and you know, stay and be the, the witness. But you would do whatever you could to protect that little girl. What about slavery? Oh, man, I guess I won't even go there. So we're not wrong to agree with God and accept the transforming power of Jesus Christ in our lives and to pray for it in the lives of others. I am so thankful for the deep, deep love of Jesus. And I am far from perfect. And I struggle with temptation. Uh, more than just sexually. Food, thoughts. Thank God that he cleans his fish after he catches them. Thank God that he loves us. Just the way. He loves us just the way we are, but he doesn't leave us there. That's the amazing part. He accepts us into the family so that he can clean us up, so that he can conform us and transform us into the image of Christ. Thank you all for being here this evening. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. I pray that if I said anything incorrectly that you would blot it from people's memories. I pray that if the Holy Spirit needs to work in people's lives that you would do that, that you would bring everything back to their thoughts and their memories over the days and weeks to come that you need to. Lord, as people look into Scripture themselves, as people study, as people are Bereans trying to figure out if I'm making it up or if I'm a whack job or if I've lost my mind, Lord, science and scripture both bear out facts. And Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see the truth, ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying to us, and that you would continue to conform us and transform us into the image of God, that you would make us the men and women of God you've called us to be, that you would take everything that we've done in the past, that you would take all of our sin, all of our uh, horrible choices, and even the bad ones, and that you would do your thing, God, that you would uh, help us to walk forward in the love and peace and joy of the Lord that you would help us to uh, renew relationships, that you would help us to love on people well. Lord, not to uh, be the guys and the gals with the picket signs and the condemning people to hell. That's not our job, uh, but to love people in the kingdom. Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.